Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Moses comes down the mountain and his face is literally glowing with God's radiance. Jesus takes three disciples up to the mountaintop and the glory of the Lord descends upon them. And both the Israelites and the disciples are scared out of their minds. It's interesting, isn't it? How often in our scriptures, the presence of God incites fear in those who witness it. God goes walking in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve rush to hide their naked selves. God calls to Moses from the burning bush, but Moses hides his face from God. Every time the angels show up in the gospels, the first words out of their mouths are always, fear not. Don't be afraid, presumably because the people are, in the words of the King James Version, sore afraid. And today, Transfiguration Sunday, the Israelites see Moses' shining face and they're afraid to approach him. The disciples witness the glory of Christ revealed on the mountaintop and they fall down terrified. Why do we respond to God with fear? Why is it that when God's people get a glimpse of God's bright shining glory, our impulse is to hide? We get just a little taste of the enormity of God's grace and suddenly we are trying to put some distance between ourselves and that ever gracious God. We see the shining radiance of the Lord beaming off of Moses' face and we cry out, someone get this man a veil, cover that up. The light, it's too bright, it's too much. Here we stand in the very presence of God and yet we cover our faces in fear. We've seen this pattern, glory, then fear over and over in scripture. And we've seen it over and over in the life of the church. Two years ago, this, this same week, the week of Transfiguration Sunday, something happened that made this liturgical moment of glory and then fear very real for me. Some of you perhaps may remember that this same week, the week before Lent in 2019, the United Methodist General Conference convened and once again voted no on the ordination of LGBTQ clergy and the marriage of same-sex couples. Now, I'm not a Methodist, though many of my loved ones are, but that's not really the point the shock waves of that no vote were about more than just one vote or one denomination. It was a blow to the whole ecumenical movement for acceptance of queer Christians, an acceptance that faithful people have been fighting for since long before I was ever born. Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, UCCers, DOCers, Catholics, Evangelicals, all sorts of Christians have spent their lives seeking a more just, more inclusive, more Christ-like church. Progress has been slow, sometimes painful, always hard won. For every two steps forward, there is a step back. And then, then I read these texts about transfiguration, glory, and then fear. And I realize, of 
course. We have heard these stories before. The thing is, God's glory can be surprising, unsettling, overwhelming, maybe even upsetting when we get that first glimpse. The Israelites saw Moses' shining face and they were afraid to approach him. The disciples heard God's own voice in the cloud and they cowered in fear. Likewise, we, the church, have witnessed the gifts for ministry that God has given to people who are part of the LGBTQ community. And we've seen how mutual love and the covenant of marriage can flourish between two people, regardless of gender. We've beheld the sacred, mystifying, uncontainable glory of God shining forth from all sorts of people, people who are straight and gay and lesbian and transgender and two-spirited and bond non-binary and queer and everything else. And too often, we the church have gone running in search of a veil. Cover his face, we say. It's just too much. We can't see that in here. God's people get a glimpse of God's bright, shining glory. We get a chance to embrace it, to just bask in it. But we are sore afraid. The church's troubling history with LGBTQ issues is a story that speaks to me on a personal level, but it is only one example of how God's people have encountered God's bright, shining glory and have turned away. I grew up in the Southern brand of the Presbyterian Church, the PCUS, for those who remember. And my colleagues have told me stories of pastoring churches in the 60s and 70s that had actual session policy on their books for what to do if an African-American person came to that church for how to greet them at the door, escort them out, and point them to a black church in town. God's people get a glimpse of God's bright, shining glory. But God's people are afraid and turn away. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes less so. There are the big moments, church policy regarding race or gender, or sexual orientation. But sometimes our Fear of that glory comes out in little things, too. The teenager with the speech impediment who is gently encouraged to serve as an usher on Youth Sunday rather than take on a speaking role. The lectern for the liturgist that is still not accessible for those in wheelchairs or whose mobility is impaired. The visitor who gets passed by at coffee hour because they don't speak that much English and no one knows quite how to start up a conversation with them. God's glory is dazzling. It's diverse and it can be overwhelming. Sometimes it does make us, sometimes it does make me afraid. We want to put a veil on it to cover it up. But the good news is we don't have to. We can change the ending to this story. Maybe, maybe we get scared because we know that bearing witness to God's glory changes us. 
it opens our hearts and our minds to God and to one another. Like Moses, we stand in the presence of God and we cannot be the same anymore. Like the disciples, we drink from the chalice of grace and we are transformed. We are changed from glory into glory for we begin to reflect that glory that we have seen. We come down from the mountain, we walk away from the table and our faces, like the face of Moses, simply shine. So next time, next time we see God's bright shining glory revealed in new and unexpected places or in new and unexpected people, what do you think would happen if we just stopped and looked and let that glory transform us? What if instead of running from it or hiding from it, we just drank that glory in? What if we dared to let down our veils and see what new thing God has in store? Because this is the good news of this Transfiguration Sunday. We have seen God's glory and therefore we have been changed. Even when we don't understand it, even when we are afraid, even when we reject God's grace, even when we try to put up a veil to go cover God's glory, it's no matter. We can't undo what God has already done. God's light has shined upon us and we have been transformed. So friends, look around you. Look around you on this call at the bright shining faces of your sisters, brothers and siblings in Christ. Look around you this week into the faces you encounter Witness the mysterious, uncontainable glory of God ever shining in the midst of God's people. Stop and bask and stand and receive the transformative, unqualified grace of Christ. Stand before God in awe and wonder and yes, even in fear and trembling. We've seen God's glory. We're not the same anymore. So when you go from this place, let your faces shine. Amen. <laughs>